Thank you for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm John Carroll in for Maya Trebolsi. Coming up, the latest from our special series on public art in San Diego. Hear from one local artist who says the airport embraced his work only to later censor it after getting complaints. Drawing attention to our climate emergency, protesters use art to push for a future without fossil fuels. An experience kids from Julian won't soon forget. See how a day at surf camp unlocks happiness for those who are growing up beyond our beach communities. We start with scrutiny over how privacy is handled by Customs and Border Protection. KPBS border reporter Gustavo Solis tells us how crime data is being accessed due to a relatively unknown contract. In response to the Trump administration's hardline immigration policies, California passed a series of laws that protect immigrants. Those laws limit cooperation between local law enforcement and federal immigration authorities. Advocates now say that a deal between the San Diego Association of Governments and Customs and Border Protection violates the spirit of those laws. In June, CBP renewed a contract worth $131,000 that grants them access to the Argus Criminal Database. Argus contains data from every law enforcement agency in the county. It includes arrests, traffic citations, and data from license plate readers. What this access um, to the Argus database does do is that it means that the relationship between um, a person having an encounter with a local police officer and that encounter then becoming um, uh, an immigration problem is increased. Cesar Cuauhtémoc García Hernández studies what he calls crimigration, which is how minor criminal activity can lead to serious immigration consequences. He says sharing this data with CBP puts immigrants at risk of being deported for something as minor as driving with an expired registration. To be clear, Sandak isn't breaking any laws by sharing this data. But Garcia Hernandez says local leaders need to think beyond just the letter of the law. For the perspective of elected officials, um, they have to think about what the, the message is that that sends because the artist database is not limited to severe crimes. It's not limited to one kind of crime or another. It's it's a it's a it's a real very wide range of of encounters with the criminal with criminal law enforcement agencies. Another concern with this arrangement is lack of oversight. Erin Surumoto Grassi is policy director with Alliance San Diego. She says CBP has proven in the past that it can't be trusted. There's a long history of, of abuse, of impunity, um, not speaking necessarily just to databases, but in general. Um, and so I think that's something that has to be really considered. Like, is this an agency we want to trust to have access? Surumoto Grassi referenced a 2019 incident in which CBP used data to spy on humanitarian workers helping people from the Central American migrant caravan. CBP did not respond to a request for comment. We have to have a clear understanding of what are the guardrails. Right? What are the guardrails that are preventing them from accessing data outside of what um, they're allowed to access. Dave Moss is the director of investigations with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. In general, what I've seen across California is that there's not a lot of quality control going on in general. He says memorandums of understanding are designed to prevent abuse, but they aren't always backed up with enforcement mechanisms. Yeah, it's really an honor honor you know, honor system, like investigate yourself, let us know how you violated it. And so it's not a particularly robust system. Argus director Anthony Ray and Sandak chairwoman Nora Vargas declined interview requests. Records show CBP has been getting Argus data since at least 2006. Sandak did respond to questions in writing. In 2019, Sandag updated its Argus policies to reflect state laws that limit cooperation between federal and local law enforcement. This included deleting search terms like undocumented. It also now requires users to enter a valid reason for each search. And it put in a disclaimer telling users not to access non-criminal data for immigration enforcement. Still, there are general concerns about the lack of enforcement tools. Even if they've agreed um, to do one thing, you can't always trust them to stick to the rules. This November 2021 exchange between former San Diego Sheriff Bill Gore and County Supervisor Tara Lawson-Reamer illustrates the limits of local oversight. 
During a community forum, Lawson Reamer asked whether the sheriff's department can be certain that they're catching other agencies breaking the rules. But There's how conduct. would we find out? I mean, right? Like, how would Sometimes we you might not. <laughs> I'm, so, I mean, so if somebody Peter picks up the phone shared. and makes a call to somebody, mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to find that out. Mm -hmm. uh, you do the best you can by educating your office what the rules are. If you do find out, you, you handle that misconduct through an investigation, appropriate disciplinary action. But I can't sit here and say and guarantee it's never happened. So we don't. So we don't really have a good mechanism to monitor other agencies. The San Diego Sheriff's Department doesn't share data directly with CBP. However, the department does share it with Argus, and Argus they're sharing it with CBP. Surumoto Grassi says indirect sharing is just as problematic. We would argue in general, right, that um, this entanglement, right, collusion between local law enforcement and federal immigration agencies across the board is going to lead to uh, lack of community trust, which makes all of us less safe. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. July has been filled with headlines about extreme heat in Southern California and all around the globe. As KPBS reporter Alexander Nguyen tells us, climate activists say it's yet another example of why the time to act is now. Dozens of protesters gather in front of the Semper Energy Building in downtown San Diego armed with chalk to raise the alarm and leave a message for the utility company. Sempra is the parent company of sdg &E and SoCal Gas. They want Sempra to divest from fossil fuels and for President Biden to declare a climate emergency. This should not be controversial in any way, shape or form. Scott Kelly is the director of Raise the Alarm and a biology professor at San Diego State. He says declaring a climate emergency is stating the obvious. We had Phoenix having record temperatures, 11 days in a row of 111 degrees. No one's ever seen this before. We had seven days of heat that exceeded the records that were set 125,000 years ago. We have hot tub-like temperatures in Florida that are killing the coral reefs. He says instead of declaring a climate emergency, Biden is expanding oil and gas drilling because of lobbying by companies like Sempra Energy. They need to stop listening to these guys and start the immediate energy transition to green energy and to renewable energy. These protesters say climate change is disrupting human life, so they need to be disruptive today. Not everyone is a fan of the disruption. Richard Keeley lives in the building across from Sempra headquarters. He's tired of protesters showing up every few months. Yeah, I think that's pretty rude. But disruption is the point. This emergency needs to be taken seriously. Sempra says it has a deep respect for environmental stewardship and is investing billions in cleaner energy. We need clean air, not another billionaire. Yeah! Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. Artistic freedom is so cherished a value that it's protected by the First Amendment. But a local artist is accusing San Diego International Airport officials of censorship. He told his story to KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma. Right after artist Evan Apodaca installed his video piece at the San Diego International Airport in February, a nearby man offered an ominous review. He stood and watched the whole thing, and when he was done, he asked me, are you the artist? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, this is woke bull Apodaca's public artwork is entitled Monumental Interventions. The piece challenges the value of the military presence in San Diego. It uses voices of local residents to express the criticism and through animation puts their words into the mouths of the international and local political figures shown as toppled, beheaded statues. There's former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Do we want to continue to, to create uh, an economy that believes in death and destruction. The piece questions whether the military should even be honored and said the early white settlements in San Diego were in part built on the backs of people south of the border and throughout the Pacific. Hidden beneath the surface 
of the plan for a white utopia has been the cost of people and natural resources of various occupied territories south of the U.S. and throughout the Pacific. Apodaca says within a month after his video piece was installed, the airport removed it from a wall near Gate 48 without warning or a reason. That is, until Apodaca went on Instagram and described what happened. On that same day in March, he says airport officials reached out to meet in person. They said, Evan, your project was not the same as what you had proposed. Airport officials declined an interview. In a written statement, airport spokeswoman Nicole Hall wrote that Apodaca's video piece was brought down, quote, because the artwork delivered by the artist did not match the proposal that had been previously approved by the arts program. But Apodaca says officials left out what else they told him. They said, the person that had made the comment to me uh, about the artwork being woke bullshit um, was the same person whose comments had gone all the way up to government appointed officials who run the airport, who had then told everyone below them in the arts department to do something about this. San Diego is no stranger to public art controversies. Last year, some outraged Escondido residents wanted an exhibit named Three Slick Pigs to be removed. It featured pig statues in police uniforms dancing. Activists have also long pushed the city of San Diego to remove a statue of former Governor Pete Wilson because of his hardline stance on undocumented people. Both the pig display and the Wilson statue remained. Elizabeth Larison is with the National Coalition Against Censorship. She says resisting artistic censorship is especially important amid today's deep political divide. We feel that we need to fight to protect access to works that contribute to the full cornucopia of, uh, what, of ideas that contribute to a shared culture. Larison argues in Apodaca's case, San Diego airport officials failed to make that fight. She studied the matter and says officials chose Apodaca's work for its creativity, artistic merit, cultural significance, and educational value. In an email last fall, Daniel Denner, curator of the airport's arts program, told Apodaca his work resonated with the airport's concept. He wrote, quote, the panel felt your work was connected to our theme by the way we choose or not to choose to listen to things around us and how they inform our future. Apodaca says he was never asked to submit the final piece to airport officials before he installed it. Larison says it's unlikely that would have made a difference. The visual and the artistic aspects are all very much still there and are not compromised. And yet the main difference is a slightly more critical viewpoint, which is explored through the voices. And that's why she describes the airport's takedown of Apodaca's art as, quote, viewpoint discrimination, or put another way, this is a case of censorship. Apodaca says he doesn't want to criticize airport officials, but we need artwork that challenges us in, in the public. It shouldn't be hiding. He says he hasn't given up on having the work displayed elsewhere. Amitha Sharma, KPBS News. Some of the most unexpected parts of San Diego are flush with art. KPBS investigative reporter Scott Rod explores the city's surprisingly aesthetic wastewater treatment system. San Diego is home to a world-class public art scene. Colorful murals stretching across entire building sides, soaring sculptures celebrating the city's heritage. <laughs> But there's a whole world of public art that thrives along the bowels of America's finest city. You have to look at something on toilet, and so it's nice to have something to look at. The city of San Diego commissioned artist Shinpei Takeda to transform the ceiling of this public restroom in Ocean Beach. He lived in the neighborhood, so the project was personal. The piece is titled, My Memory on Top of Your Memory. It features quotes from famous authors whose names appear on nearby street signs layered over excerpts from local news stories. Takeda says a public restroom is an excellent canvas for public expression. If art is something that makes us think, something that makes us reflect, you know, and I think it can be anywhere and then where else better to do it when you're 
you know, doing a most biological business. Takeda's piece is our starting point as we explore the artwork sprinkling San Diego's sewage system. About a mile north is another piece funded by the city's arts commission on a public restroom. The work, titled Pixelated Summer, is a collage of photo tiles capturing the frenetic joy of nearby Belmont Park and the summer serenity of Mission Beach. Jacob Bishop was wrapping up a morning of metal detecting on the sand when he stopped to consider the artwork. It gives a little bit of style, which is what we have here, San Diego. It just adds a little bit of a peacefulness, I think. He says it reminds him of bringing his daughters to the ocean when they were little. I try to teach them surf, you know, put the leash around their leg up high because it didn't fit, but they had their little wetsuits and it was a lot of fun. When you flush at these beach bathrooms, the water flows first to a pump station near the San Diego airport. Pump stations help sewage reach treatment plants. Nearly half a dozen of them around the city feature public art, including a plaza filled with sandstone pillars and mosaics with native stones and handmade tiles. From the pump station, our effluent expedition continues to the Point Loma wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, we may be dealing with shit, but somebody else can look at this and find something beautiful in it. Richard Turner is a prolific public artist. He produced several pieces on the outside of the Point Loma plant, including a series of abstract metal patterns. Some are a cascade of blue, green, and purple, representing the ocean. Others are a mix of rusty black and brown, representing the sewage treated inside. The installation also includes an interactive section of pipe, the exact kind of pipe the plant uses to safely discharge treated wastewater, about 150 million gallons a day, into the ocean. I thought, okay, so here I've got an opportunity to actually bring visitors inside the technology or a part of the plant itself. Turner has artwork on five wastewater treatment facilities in California, including two in San Diego. I like the quirkiness of it, but I also felt more importantly that here's an interesting challenge for me. In addition to the Point Loma facility, Turner left his mark on the Metro Biosolid Center in Kearney Mesa, which is the next stop on our wastewater voyage. The center processes treated sludge from Point Loma. The artwork starts at the front gate, continues in the lobby, and spreads throughout the main administrative building. People see it and they ask questions. When I tell them what it is, it's, they find it very interesting. Richard Pitchford is the superintendent at the Biosolid Center. He says the artwork forces visitors to ponder the complex process that happens after they use the bathroom. When you flush it, it's gone. I don't have to deal with it anymore. Well, we deal with it on the other end, and it's, it's actually a fascinating industry. The dung beetle is a recurring motif throughout the installation. The bug eats animal droppings and then recycles nutrients back into the ecosystem. It's a perfect metaphor for the biosolid center, which turns semi-processed sludge into fertilizer cakes used to grow non-edible crops. The artwork also explores a bit of San Diego sanitation history, such as... When the city had the low flow toilet initiative and they were replacing all the toilets, you know, you can see the piles of toilets down there, you know, and that kind of represents, well, that's where all this used to go or come from. And then they, they made artwork out of all those broken toilets. Pitchford says one of his favorite pieces is a series of little floating, well, logs on one of the hallway walls. They start out a brownish clay color and then slowly turn to a shimmering gold. I probably walked by it several times before I really figured out, oh, this is what it's representing. You can start out with something that's basically somebody's waste, and by the end of the process, it is worth something. He even found symbolism in the blank spaces at the end of the wall. We don't know what the future holds for our biosolids. I never once considered those empty spaces having any meaning whatsoever. But the fact that he is bringing meaning to that piece, that is great. I love that. In the end, I suppose that's what all this bathroom art is about. Finding meaning and value where you least expect it. Some food for thought the next time you hit the head. Scott Rod, KPBS News. You can learn more about public art in San Diego on our website. Just go to kpbs.org slash public art to find art in your neighborhood. And let us know which pieces you'd like to see us profile. 
Surfing and San Diego would seem to go hand in hand, but not for everyone. For some children, trips to the beach are rare. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado takes us to a summer camp, giving kids a chance to ride the waves. In my dreams, the ocean's like just a magical place. Have you ever thought about how the ocean makes you feel? Jameson Wynn has. He loves it so much, he sees it in his dreams. That the ocean feels like just like a rain of magic coming over you and making you feel great inside. His younger brother Cole says the ocean makes him feel at peace. Um, the sun's always out and it's really like it takes away all your problems. They live in Julian on the outskirts of San Diego County. So visits to the beach are few and far between. We live far away from the ocean and we don't get to see it a lot. And that's where Camp Surf comes in. So we're awesome to start our first surf carnival of the summer. Are you all stoked? This summer, they and dozens of other children got to spend a week at this magical place on Imperial Beach. Since 1969, this YMCA overnight camp has been making dreams come true for children all over the world. This year alone, nearly 900 children will get the camp surf experience. We're really focusing on positive youth development. While surfing is just one activity they learn at Camp Surf, Kapili Pasa, the camp's waterfront manager, says it's the key that unlocks happiness. We use surfing as a really big tool to be able to get them to trust in themselves, trust in each other, and then just get to experience the beautiful ocean. But unfortunately, Camp Surf is a place most children will only see in their dreams. Coming to the beach and dreaming about it just makes me feel a lot more calm and happy. Jackson Rosas from Escondido says he's in the same boat as the Wind Brothers. I don't see the ocean that often. I don't surf that often. And he thinks of the beach a lot too. Imagine that you're sitting on the beach, watching the waves. He also says people make assumptions about kids like them just because they live in California. People think that I go to the beach a lot. But Naveen Alaves, who helps run the YMCA camp programs in Escondido, says the reality is spending a day at the beach is rare for most children who live in the county. And a whole week, well, that's just simply out of reach for most families, especially families like theirs that live on the county's margins. If it weren't for this week of camp, a lot of these kids would stay at home. Some of our older siblings taking care of, you know, younger siblings, um, parents are working. A reality she knows all too well. I myself didn't, you know, didn't grow up going to the beach. Even though I grew up in Encinitas, I lived probably like 10 minutes from the beach. It wasn't something that my parents had access to. But this year, she and her fellow YMCA Escondido Impact Ambassadors raised $25,000 to change that for 50 Escondido students. I want to give a voice to those students, to those families. Among them, Jackson. I got to surf, boogie board, and meet new friends. Jackson says Camp Surf changed him for the better. I feel like I kind of am a new person because I was meeting new people, doing new things, and going out of my comfort zone. And the Wynn brothers, they feel different too. Maybe it's the surf lakes they grew in just a week. This experience at the YMCA has made this life a lot better and made me dream bigger about things. After harnessing the power of the ocean, they feel like nothing is impossible. It made me dream bigger of being a pro surfer and um, learning stuff that I didn't know that a nine-year-old could do. But like all good things, their camp surf came to an end. We love surfing! But they will always carry a little piece of camp surf with them. And they can always visit in their dreams. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. A reminder, you can find stories from our newsroom and so much more at the Kate PBS YouTube page. Subscribe and get notifications for new content posted daily. That's also where we live stream KPBS Evening Edition weekdays at 5. Hundreds of local kids are spending their summer learning on Olympic-inspired soccer fields. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez shows us how the game is providing lessons in leadership. Kick, pass, or get out of the way. These players are serious about their soccer. 
a lot of passion, a lot of time. You got to put in the work. It takes a lot. 12 year old Isaac Vargas plays goalie or any other position his team needs filled. For two months, he is committed to weekly summer camps here at the Chula Vista Olympic Training Center. Get it, get it, get it. These players come from elementary and middle school campuses across San Diego Unified, which has partnered with the Chicano Federation and the San Diego Foundation to provide skills and life lessons, preventing learning loss and teaching problem solving, decision making, team building, and helping with mental health too. We see it on a day to day. Uh, youth start off being really shy. Sometimes they don't know anybody else that's in the camp, but very quickly they make friends, they develop self-confidence, and that's what it's all about. The camp runs all day and it's free to children who have applied to be here from neighborhoods that are under-resourced and often underserved. A half a million dollars from the district's summer enrichment budget makes the practice and the potential for progress possible. We need individuals to bring their full selves, to be a part of a team, a part of the collective. And we need the collective to see the individuals and their, their full potential. Along with all they are learning here, students are also getting ready for college, believe it or not. Once they're finished with the camp, they will each receive four units of college credit. The credit for leadership training is redeemable anytime in the future at UC San Diego, one of the camp's other sponsors. 11-year-old Lola Banta is well on her way to reaching her goals off and on the field. It feels awesome because you learned, because you felt that you did a, a goal that you wanted to do and you also scored one for your team so you guys could win. Those are important points for anyone keeping score. MG Perez, KPBS News. We hope you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm John Carroll. Thanks for joining us.